appreciate that. Next, uh, joining us virtually from Canberra is uh, Susanna Jessup. And many thanks. It's, it's wonderful to be back at the INZBC, and I'm sorry I can't join you in person. Uh, this evening, as you say, Manjeet, I'm beaming in from Canberra, uh, where my colleagues and I have been meeting with Australian officials and experts and hearing their perspectives on how Australia is tracking with its big Asia partnerships, including India. And we're also hearing how Australia is working with like-minded countries who share similar interests in the Indo-Pacific and the so-called rules-based order to help them navigate the complex disruptions um, we're experiencing in our region, primarily as a result of China's rise and expansion, but also in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And if there's one thing we find from undertaking these visits is that they're prescient for New Zealand. Um, what's happening in Australia today is very often New Zealand's tomorrow. And I think today itself, COVID has taught us that lesson directly. And so if Australia is so much of a bellwether for us, particularly in terms of our China relationship, then it's clear that New Zealand and including New Zealand business that um, New Zealand needs to plan for the likelihood of greater disruption and uncertainty. And much has been said to business on both sides of the Tasman about diversification as a strategy to manage uh, this risk in the Indo-Pacific. And it's undeniable that India and the, the Indo of the Indo-Pacific is a market that many businesses would like to diversify into. It's a market that the New Zealand government has been working to build a relationship with for many years through FDA negotiations. But, you know, it's a tough market and a highly competitive one. And without any formal trade architecture, it's ultimately going to be up to the private sector to decide whether India is a market that it wishes to invest in. But we do know through research conducted by the Asian New Zealand Foundation, where I work, that um, we have some way to go in terms of deepening our knowledge of India but that doing so will be hugely beneficial to us in terms of building the necessary know-how and, and confidence to thrive in India. Um, but in this session, it's not just about counting opportunities in terms of their rupee and dollar value. Um, part of the Indo-Pacific narrative is around building value uh, and trusted partnerships in the world outside our respective borders and economies partnerships that, as Minister Mahuta has just noted, that really respect sovereignty and territorial integrity and follow international rules and norms and support multilateral institutions that countries such as New Zealand really depend on. And these are the things that ultimately provide the conditions that enable businesses in New Zealand and India to flourish together. However, once again, we know from our research conducted at the Asia New Zealand Foundation that the Asia Pacific is not um, well understood by New Zealanders, as the High Commissioner has just noted, um, but that New Zealanders are becoming more aware that the world in which we operate is less stable and less predictable. And in fact, our research shows that one in four New Zealanders are worried about political and security issues in our region having a negative impact on New Zealand in the next decade or so. And so really the question for countries such as New Zealand and India is, is what, what actual steps can we take together to offer more stability and predictability for our private sector? And how can we work together to ensure the systems and structures we rely on continue to function effectively? And so I'd just like to conclude by really echoing the comments that we've heard in the opening session today. You know, as two nations who have had long-standing and, and friendly connections built on shared values, uh, New Zealand and India should be doing more together in the Indo-Pacific as partners invested in the stability, health and prosperity of our region. And this makes good sense because all indications suggest that India is going to play an increasingly important part of our future. Um, and I just and I love to finish. India always produces fabulous stats, and I apologise to those in the room who've heard these stats a thousand times. But you know, it's a country on track to have the world's largest population by 2030, one of the world's largest economies by 2050 and beyond. Produces 67,000 babies every day, new billionaire every week, a million tertiary graduates into the workforce every month. And the one that I've loved of recent in May 2021, um, in the space of just four days, India produced 
six new startups with a valuation of $1 billion each, which techies like to call unicorns because they're supposed to be such rarities. And so one-tenth of the world's population today is made up of Indians under the age of 30. So if if that's not reason enough to be um, really looking at India seriously and looking at how we can build this relationship, then I don't know what is. Thank you very much. Uh, next joining us online is MP Terikatene. Tēnā koutou oku rangatira, tēnā koutou e te iwi no inia, tēnā koutou whakatau mai te ao pākehi, whakatau mai te whanaunga tanga a tāua nei o Aotearoa me inia. Nō reira, e rau rangatira mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, esteemed members of the panel, members of the uh, India New Zealand Business Council, and all those who are uh, tuning in, uh, both here in Aotearoa and abroad, uh, tēnā koutou, kia ora to you all. Uh, Delighted to be able to participate in this discussion on Indo-Pacific strategic ties. Uh, I'm the uh, Undersecretary uh, for Trade and Export Growth and also for Oceans and Fisheries, but uh, the These issues are maybe a bit beyond my purview, but what I can say is that uh, Indo-Pacific is very, um, we are connected in Aotearoa to the great uh, oceans of the Pacific, and by expanding that to uh, include the uh, Indian Ocean and Indo-Pacific really acknowledges the significance and influence of India. And I know that uh, here in Aotearoa, we want to encourage greater uh, engagement and greater Uh, participation, just in recognition of the significance that India plays uh, in in the uh, strategic uh, security of of the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, there are uh, multi-prongs to, I guess, all of the activities that we are undertaking. Uh, But one thing that, uh, one area that I am very passionate about and with my undersecretary role is really just promoting the trade uh, aspects, in particular with the uh, Māori economy that we have here in Aotearoa. Uh, We are uh, the indigenous people of Aotearoa, but we have long associations with our Indian communities here in Aotearoa and and in India. And uh, we are always, uh, as we are as a a nation, looking to uh, have a priority relationships with India. And I'm uh, proud to be able to do the work to to encourage the uh, greater participation by uh, the Māori sector uh, with India. And I believe uh, we can really uh, make great strides in that area uh, through working with the private sector, through the uh, India Business Council, uh, and uh, promote that uh, whanaungatanga, that relationships uh, that we have. Can I acknowledge the cultural connections that uh, we've made right from the uh, uh, opening blessing through to the mihis, through to our minister's speech, which I uh, uh, endorse totally. Uh, We have a lot in common just through our shared colonial histories. uh, And uh, we want to be able to take that, um, not only with the Māori economy, but as New Zealand Aotearoa into that trade area and obviously build our relationships across the Indo-Pacific. Trade is obviously very important. We know that um, bilateral uh, uh, arrangements are, are a challenge and they may take some time, but uh, by, by um, taking it to the level with the private sector business, uh, I believe that great uh, progress can be made, whether it's through investments. And in particular with the Māori economy, I want to uh, stress or emphasise the cultural uh, dimension that we might have working with India, uh, whether it's in the services, uh, digital, creative sectors, I think those are areas whereby we have stories to tell, we have uh, cultures to share, and there are great opportunities there which I'd like to encourage uh, through the business network and also uh, through to India as well. So uh, thank you for uh, this uh, wonderful summit and kia ora tato katoa. Thank you. Uh, May I now request... May I now request His Excellency David Pine, the New Zealand High Commissioner to India, to make his remarks. He's speaking to us online as well. Namaskar. Um, Namihi, uh, Professor Padisi, and thanks again to uh, all of our friends at the India New Zealand Business Council. I mean, there does seem to be quite a strong consensus uh, in what we're hearing around two key points. Uh, First is that the tides of history are pushing countries that value democracy closer together. 
and India knows this. Uh, I was very struck by a recent interview given by uh, Gautam Bambawali, who's a former colleague of Muktesh's, uh, a very distinguished Indian diplomat, former ambassador to China. And he was very forthright in talking about an emerging competition between authoritarian states and democracies, and in saying that India can't sit on the fence on this and needs to come down on the side of democracy. Ambassador Bambawali observed that what's required are strong and interlocking economic contacts and interests among the democracies, large scale and deep people to people ties and long lasting interinstitutional linkages. And perhaps his most significant observation was that achieving these linkages might require India to adjust some of its domestic policies, uh, which is something it's not needed to do in the past. So these comments aren't official government, Indian government policy, but they do encapsulate the willingness we're seeing here to engage more closely with New Zealand. What people have been telling me uh, that they see when they look at what New Zealand has to offer can be summed up in four ideas, stability, capability, economic strength, and a great democracy. And as Minister Mahuta pointed out, we need to build on this, moving beyond buyer-seller relationships. And, and as everybody has been saying, um, we've perhaps taken too short term an approach. Perhaps we've focused New as New Zealand too much on um, the economic dimension to the expense of the others and within the economic dimension, specifically on the trade dimension. Now I'm saying this, I'm very aware of who I'm speaking to I'm, uh, and I'm probably preaching to the converted. The people in this room are the people who are making the biggest effort to correct all of this. Um, so what I'm saying is, isn't that you need to change, it's that we need to find a way to grow more people who think like you. Um, the second area of opportunity comes, as everyone's pointed out, from the remarkable change in New Zealand's demography over the last two decades and the enormous growth in the Indian community that everyone's spoken about. And this is obviously potentially wonderful for the relationship as well as for the country. Um, but if all that was needed was a large diaspora, our relationship with India would already be a lot further ahead than we are. The reality is we have a larger diaspora proportionately than Australia, but no one could honestly claim that our bilateral relationship yet has anything near the breadth and depth of the relationship that India enjoys with our trans-Tasman neighbour. We need to find new ways to unleash the potential we have through our diaspora, and there's a lot of work to do. So what are we doing? Um, High Commissioner Padeshi mentioned the um, recent foreign ministry talks, and I, I just want to touch on a few of the things uh, that, that came up in that. Um, there was definitely a shared understanding that our cooperation on security and defence matter, uh, matters is more important than ever. We're finalising agreements, uh, a defence agreement and an agreement on white shipping. India participates in the Christchurch call and we're looking at more regular exchanges and information sharing on regional security, counter-terrorism, including its financial dimensions and transnational crime. We're exploring how we might have a better dialogue on cybersecurity. And we are seeing much more interest from India in the South Pacific region, which is obviously welcome uh, from our perspective. India is a very capable partner with a lot to contribute to our neighbourhood. We are looking at a mechanism to annualise formal economic and trade dialogue. This is something High Commissioner Pardeshi and I have both been advocating for some time. The diligent researchers at India's um, Ministry of External Affairs uncovered that we do have some sort of agreement going back to the 1980s uh, that says we should be doing this anyway. Um, but it seems to have lapsed over time. There's a new willingness to reinvigorate this and we will get on with it. Both sides are committed to supporting the commencement of direct air services as soon as possible. We both believe we were close to seeing this before uh, the pandemic struck and we want to get back to it as soon as it's possible. We want to see much stronger cultural engagement 
Our High Commission here will be focusing our public diplomacy on two things, rivers, which we believe are a shared, uh, of shared significance to both countries, culturally, spiritually, economically, environmentally. And we're working to, on the empowerment of women. We've found a great partner, a major arts festival organiser, Artworks, and we're, we're looking to, to help them to bring some of India's culture to New Zealand. Historically, Māori have not had quite as significant a presence in India as in other parts of Asia. We're trying to understand why this is and see what we can do about it. And the High Commission exchanged letters with Te Taumata last year, and we've agreed on a realistic agenda to take this forward, building on the great potential um, that uh, Reno Tirukatani spoke so eloquently about. Uh, High Commissioner, Finally, may I please uh, request you yeah. to... <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's enough. That, that's fine. <laughs> I was going to talk about investment, but that's fine. Great. I'm so sorry to interject you there, but uh, there will be opportunity again in the Q&A to reiterate some of the points. So thank you for that. Uh, and we now move on to our fifth and final speaker on this panel, Ambassador Rajiv Patia from Gateway House, who's speaking to us online from India. Ambassador Patia, uh, uh, yeah. your microphone. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, now we can. Warm greetings from uh, New Delhi to our hosts, the leadership of the India and New Zealand Business Council, uh, to the Honorable Ministers, to the two High Commissioners, panelists, and uh, all participants. I'll be very succinct and brief, knowing the uh, time uh, situation. I uh, simply want to begin by saying that uh, the factor of geographic uh, distance and the reality of rather limited contacts in the past between India and New Zealand are now getting trumped by converging strategic perspectives. Uh, the shared bonds of Commonwealth, cricket, common law, English language, and an expanding Indian community in New Zealand are now uh, giving a new momentum uh, to this uh, relationship. So we all agree that possibilities are good, future is good. The question is how to achieve uh, uh, you know, some concrete results. And uh, as someone who has had a, a mixed uh, background, diplomatic experience, academic experience, and business promotion experience, let me present to this distinguished audience, and particularly to our panel, five specific policy suggestions, and I'll list them out quickly uh, for your consideration and uh, discussion. First, India considers New, De New Zealand as a significant partner in the Indo-Pacific. New Zealand could study closely the growing progress in India launched Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative and consider choosing one of the seven pillars to collaborate as Australia, Japan, and France have already done. Second, a trilateral track one dialogue involving India, New Zealand, and Australia should be initiated to deepen synergy on the broader aspects of the region and to expand mutually beneficial ties of cooperation with the Pacific Island states. Three, a track 1.5 dialogue involving officials and experts of India, New Zealand, Australia, and Indonesia should be considered in order to discuss and craft a common approach on issues of strategy, maritime security, economic cooperation, including the health sector, joint combat against the pandemic, technological cooperation, climate action, and above all, the blue economy. Fourth, broadening the existing arrangements to institutions, namely Asia New Zealand Foundation and New Zealand India Research Institute, as well as the Indian Council of World Affairs, and uh, maybe another think tank with economic business orientation, such as Gateway House based in Mumbai, should agree to work together to produce a roadmap 2027 for this relationship, for its uh, deepening and uh, diversification. Finally, 
the india new zealand relationship will get a boost if the present deficit in the vvip level interaction could be remedied quickly an early in person meeting or even an extended digital interaction at the highest political level will send the right signal of increased resolve to raise the quantum and public profile of the of this rather underperforming equation in addition it will be simply great if the prime minister of new zealand could accept the invitation to attend the inaugural session of fiki leads 2021 conference i hope these uh, suggestions will receive consideration and suitable thought thank you very much uh, moderator and chair thank you very much uh, ambassador for those very concrete uh, suggestions um, and thank you all the panelists for your remarks i would like to now take this opportunity to ask a few questions to elaborate on the points that some of you uh, have raised i will begin with the two uh, high commissioners uh, pardeshi and uh, high commissioner uh, pardeshi and high commissioner pine uh, both of you mentioned uh, various aspects of of factors that are driving new zealand's and india's indo pacific policy Uh, uh, High Commissioner Pardeshi, you mentioned values, uh, and High Commissioner Pine mentioned democracy. I'm going to cut to the chase, and I'm going to ask: What are India's and New Zealand's perspectives on China and the United States in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, and I guess we will start with uh, High Commissioner Pardeshi before we move on to uh, High Commissioner Pine. Well, uh, let me uh, clarify that. Uh, india's vision of indo pacific is inclusive and i highlighted in my intervention it should not be construed that the indo pacific as a construct is to exclude anyone from the emerging geopolitical scenario in the indo pacific that is not the the vision that india uh, cherishes it it's a positive uh, approach there is a positive vision any one belonging to the indo pacific region or beyond are invited to participate as stakeholders the idea is to maintain uh, stability security rule based order who doesn't want i was a diplomat in in geneva the basic premise is we must respect international law which has evolved over last 100 years at different four so that's the the faith international community has in so what the group is the indo pacific uh, stakeholders are talking about is as per the norms of international law and Uh, thank you very much high commissioner for those uh, for uh inclusivity is um is absolutely central to any indo-pacific construct and the onus on anybody putting any sort of construct together has to be to articulate what it is you actually stand for and why you're trying to do it rather than um talk about um other drivers or what you might be perceived to be against and the same is true i think of new zealand's diversification agenda i i think we need to talk more about the countries we want to have closer relationships with and why we want to have those relations and today's a perfect opportunity to do that Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next I have a question uh, for MP Tirikatene. How does Maori trade view India in the Pacific and how can the blue economy be worked into bilateral relations with India? Well, Maori uh view India is a is a great opportunity uh the the, the size and significance of of India um presents great opportunities not only for Maori though but for for New Zealand as a whole but we we are fully committed to the um uh, to the work that our government is doing and continues to do in terms of building uh 
trade access or bilateral relationships. Uh, and that also flows into the, um, the security realm as well with the Indo-Pacific. And uh, I want to endorse um, High Commissioner Pine's uh, remarks. I can think of no better person to lead uh, uh, the inclusiveness of, of New Zealand of, and within the Indo-Pacific, with India, then a High Commissioner Pine. He, he led the work uh, of trade for all, the trade for all agenda for New Zealand, uh, which has reset our whole trade, our whole views on trade um, to being inclusive. Uh, and now he's continuing on that work uh, in his role as the High Commissioner in India. Uh, and uh, so we are fully behind that. In terms of the blue economy, we share the vast expanse of uh, the, the Pacific Ocean uh, with massive uh, EEZs um, between uh, India and New Zealand. So those areas of um, strategic uh, security, uh, trade, maritime, uh, we, we share commonalities. And I think uh, there's so, so many areas that we can uh, work more closely on. And uh, I'm fully supportive of the work through uh, our, that our High Commission and our Ministry of Foreign Affairs are doing. Uh, likewise, building relationships um, through uh, the private sector, through the business community. Uh, that's uh, an area that I'd like to uh, focus on, given the restrictions that we have going offshore at the moment, to build those relationships with our uh, New Zealand India Business Council uh, and uh, with the Māori uh, economy, economic interests as well, uh, so that we can, you know, further those relationships and uh, uh, whether it's the blue economy or uh, through the whole, the whole strategic uh, Indo-Pacific region as well. Kia ora. Great, thank you very much. Speaking of... in your experience working on trade strategy with the respective governments of both India and New Zealand? Yes, uh, you know, I've been involved in this ecosystem for, say, a good part of two decades now. But today, personally, uh, I am experiencing a moment of joy because after many, many years, uh, in an India New Zealand business council, we are talking about a very, and everyone, we are all on the same page, that we are talking about a very holistic 360 degree relationship, and also talking about the centrality of Indo-Pacific to it. So I think this is the track, and it's not just about trade, it's not just about transactions. I always, you know, one of my favorite things is that uh, sometimes the New Zealand lens is very transactional, whereas the Indian lens is very relationship-based, and we have to bring that closer, and I can see that today everyone's uh, talking about that. And trade and transaction will be an outcome of that wider, bigger relationship which we can developed between India and New Zealand. I would also like to add one more thing on the Maori aspect to that. Uh, we both are ancient cultures, the Indian culture and the Maori culture. And I think there's a lot more work to be done on that. There are so many similarities in the Maori way of life and the Indian way of life, which we can bring to the surface and help uh, aid, further deepen a very, and develop a very meaningful relationship. And I always say, don't uh, forget, trade will be an outcome of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for highlighting uh, the fact that we need to take a wider perspective uh, and look for aspects and things to do beyond trade. And on that note, I would like to bring in uh, Susanna Jessup, so as we uh, think of New Zealand-India relations beyond trade, what are some of the issue areas where both India and New Zealand... Well, thanks, Mandate. I mean, I think there's the lovely thing about the New Zealand-India relationship is there's already um, a real sense of ease and partnership. We see it through the foundation um, all the time in terms of our under 30s and young Indians and New Zealanders and how they're connecting. Um, and so in many respects, it's not so much, much 
which areas are we going to focus in? Although I think um, really looking at niche areas is going to be important, but it's just providing those touch points. So I would just like to emphasize um, the point that Rajiv has made about um, making sure we provide lots of opportunity to connect our people, to connect um, our young people, to connect culturally, to connect across that sort of 360 of the relationship. Um, and getting you know that, those connections done while you're in a pandemic is going to be really tough. Um, but in due course, hopefully with a, a comprehensive air services um, agreement and lots of opportunity to connect by ear, then we can really rectify that and start to build up all of those touch points. Um, but certainly when we've looked at our research too, uh, New Zealanders uh, recognise India as an important trading partner, but they also talk about tech and innovation and entrepreneurship, and they recognise India as a rising um, maritime power. So there's lots of areas where New Zealanders are telling us that they're interested in, but I think, um, you know, how long is a piece of string? We could really, we just need to provide the platforms. Great. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, on the uh, as a friendly country, but now uh, it's also viewed as a significant partner with the adoption of the Indo-Pacific uh, construct. And that is the reason why it, it's very important uh, not merely to keep this relationship uh, confined to the governments and business leaders. They, of course, uh, are playing a very major and important role. But to broaden it to include uh, uh, members of the civil society, think tanks, uh, media, experts, and others who can also do some solid advanced thinking for the governments and for the business organizations. And that is the reason, uh, if I may say, uh, some of us have contributed in the past to this process. And I think we are willing to do more in the future now that the strategic circumstances have changed. I picked up from uh, your foreign minister, uh, you know, a very key phrase that she used today, common geostrategic challenges. I think that is the way to remember so that uh, the full spectrum, the full spectrum of tools available to the two governments could be deployed for our shared goals. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would now like to open uh, the floor in the interest of time, and I have six seconds left. In the interest of time, <laughs> I'm going to take just one question from the audience. So I saw the first hand being raised right over there. So please. Question for... Um... Indian High Commission, sir, is um, are we going to have any free trade in future, please? At the moment, as, as you can look at the two different two countries, the trade, what we're doing with India and New Zealand is only 2.7 billion trade. When you compare to China, we're doing 32 billion trade. So we are less than 10%. So if the free trade comes up, maybe it can increase the opportunities for Indian Kiwis over here to export. Free trade uh, talks were happening in uh, under two frameworks. One uh, was RCEP, Regional Economic uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and India had decided to uh, remain outside the the ambit of RCEP. So that's in a in a in a regional framework. The other one is a bilateral uh, free trade discussions which were launched uh, after a study which was conducted in 2008. Negotiations started in 2010. Some rounds had uh, taken place, but when the RCEP negotiations started, the discussions around bilateral free trade were also subsumed under the, the regional uh, free trade talks. Uh, recently, during the foreign office uh, consultations, we have agreed to revive all trade-related issues bilaterally. So we are going to revive the, the Joint Trade Committee, which is constituted under the trade agreement that we have, uh, which was signed in 1986. And we'll work with the MFAT early scheduling of uh, uh, the trade talks under the Joint committee framework. And then we'll see how we can proceed further. 
Thank you very much. Uh, as, as you can see, uh, we've spoken about and touched upon a number of topics uh, from geopolitics uh, to trade to maritime security to students to connectivity. Uh, and the underlying message essentially is that we need to take a big picture look uh, at the India-New Zealand relationship. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me that this has been uh, a wonderful uh, panel. Uh, if you could join me in thanking all our panelists and including those who joined.